All right, it's just gone on nine o'clock. Um, so I'm just going to say good morning, everybody. And I hope you're keeping slightly warm on this slightly chilly morning, but at least the sunshine is out. Um, so I am Elizabeth Morwillard. I'm the first name on the left there, and I'm actually the faculty librarian for Agri Sciences. And then my colleague Kirchner van Deventer is also here, so I'm just going to ask him to introduce himself quickly. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Kirchner van Deventer. I'm the head of the uh, research commons in the library, and I will be managing all the questions in the chat boxes. Uh, if you have a question, you can use the raise hand function, and uh, then I will uh, ask Elizabeth uh, to just uh, wait a second to answer. Um, uh, Elizabeth, just on another note, uh, somebody seems to have accidentally created a separate uh, Teams meeting. So there's still people joining it, so I'm going to have to jump between the different meetings to keep telling them uh, to join this one. That's 100% fine, Kirchner. Um, I think let's just write it off to Wednesday and let's give everybody a couple of minutes to join. OK, I was it looks like everybody left that meeting and I ended it so nobody else should be able to join it. OK, great, so I think then let's get going. Um, so I'm just going to move that little bit to the side there, but still I can mute myself if needed. So I'm just going to go through what we're going to cover today in this morning's session. And I'm first going to just start with the basics of a literature review. It's something we all get told you just must do a literature review. It's part of every study, but it really helps for you to understand why and what the purpose is. So we're going to go over that and kind of what it is. And you'll see those two kind of are really linked what it is and the purpose of it. Then we're going to go into your how to do a literature review and there are six steps you can see here. So sometimes you can simplify some of these steps and you'll see there's a lot of linking across the steps to each other, but we're going to cover each of those steps um, individually. Yeah. So let's start with the basics. When you look at what the definition of a literature review, you can see it's made up of a few different elements. The first one is that it is a critical evaluation and I'd just like you to also imagine the word critical before summary and explanation. So it'll be a critical evaluation, a critical summary and a critical explanation. And those three are very important because often the mistake that gets made is it's just seen as a summary. It's not just a summary, it's an evaluation and an explanation as well. And in addition to this, you have to have that critical thinking aspect of it. It's not just regurgitating knowledge. You have to interact with that knowledge. OK, if everyone can just mute their mics. Great, thanks. Yeah, I'm trying to see who needs to be muted. OK. So then in the second part, you can see that it's the complete and current state of knowledge. So it's very important to note that current, but there is no way you will know what will be on your topic in the future. But you can say up to this date where I've done my literature review, this is how the knowledge stands. And that's what the point of it is. It's you supposed to be giving this kind of overview and interact with it. And your limited topic is, of course, your research question. So it relates directly to that. I see here there's quite a couple of people joining. Should we give a moment or two? Uh, yes, maybe. Uh, there were a couple of email requests to join, so I think some of them are coming in now, yeah. 
Okay, so I'm going to let everybody just look at this beautiful definition for a while. Not too long, a minute or two. Elizabeth, you could maybe answer the following question that was asked um, by someone in the general chat. Uh, so it didn't appear here in the chat. I'm posting it now. And Mr. Katakula, uh, yes, uh, we will send out all the PDF files. Also for yesterday's uh, system systematic reviews will be sent out as well. Uh, great. Kirk, do you mind just reading the question to me? I, of course, can't see it because I'm sharing my screen. Of course. Sorry, my bad. Uh, will you discuss what academic articles and books are relevant to the issue of literature review? Um, yes, I will. And you're jumping a little bit ahead there. So when we get to the second step in your search in your literature review, which is search the literature, we're going to cover what you will be collecting. And that includes the books and academic articles as well as a couple of other things. So yes, 100% it will be discussed. OK, the pinging has stopped, so I'm going to carry on at this point. So um, you're going to notice that what I've tried to do now in the, with regards to the purpose of a literature review is actually color code the same colors to the definition. So you'll see in terms of that, the first thing for why you do a literature review is you're going to do it in order to identify gaps. And you'll see that that relates completely to the complete and current state of knowledge. So you are identifying gaps that are in the state of knowledge on your topic. It avoids reinventing the wheel. The reason why it's one of the first things that your supervisors will tell you to do is to read the literature is because you may have this great idea and somebody may have already done it. So you need to make sure that that's not going to happen. And the only way to do that is by doing the literature review, doing your reading. You are also in that way, you're building on a foundation of existing knowledge. Come on. Um, and it's making sure that in that way you're standing on what other researchers have already done. It also lets you find other people working in the same field, and this can really be important for not only finding the main researchers in your field, but for future connections as well. So it already starts to let you find kind of, oh, this person, you know, really works in it. And if you go to a conference at a point and you meet that person, you know what they're working on. It really does help kind of set you up for building a network in that way. It demonstrates the depth of your knowledge, so it shows that you're a lot more than just someone who can just recite things back at will. You actually engage and you have critical thinking around your literature and around your topic. And very importantly, it identifies the most important works in your area. So again, I'm going to be using this word seminal works and I'll get to what exactly it means, but basically it just means it's the most important works in your area. Okay, so you can see that there's a thinking around why you have to do the literature review. It's not for every, it's not everybody's no, I don't know if anybody really enjoys doing it, but it is a necessary part of research because it actually lets you really stand on what other researchers have done and it cements you as a researcher in your own right. So most of this presentation is going to be about the how to literature review aspect. So in a start, just diving right in with that. I just want to check that, Kirkland, are there no questions with regards to the definition or anything so far, right? Uh, not at the moment. Okay, great. First step, and I'm going to put it very simply, is selecting your topic. So we've got these six steps, and we're going to start with selecting the topic. And I'm not going to go too much into depth here. There's actually a lot of resources out there for how to narrow your topic down if you're not sure. The main things that I want to say is that find what you are curious about. If you are busy with um, something, find something that really sparks your curiosity and that you've got an interest in. And you will have done that because if you've remarked on a study, you've thought about it. The reason why is that curiosity really gives a good drive throughout your research because you have these unanswered questions within yourself 
and that's a great motivation. If you don't have that curiosity, you're going to have to rely on a lot of other motivation maybe. But that internal like burning curiosity is really good to motivate you for, throughout your study. If you have this very broad curiosity, say now you know that you want to have a look at, you know, okay, I'm going to just go back on agri-sciences here, um, what the effect of pine trees are on feinbos. So it's very broad because there's so many different types of feinbos, there's different species of pine trees and so on and so forth. That's where you'll really work with your supervisor to define your topic. So you're going to get it down to very specific. So you're going to get down to perhaps okay, what are the effects of Pinus padea, a very specific one type of pine tree on a very specific plot in the Hauswerk de Pass? What is the effect on it? Has it damaged Feinbos? Does it actually help Feinbos? And that is a big difference between just what is the general effect. So you really need to work with your supervisor. Reading will also really help you to narrow it down a lot because what happens then is that you will be able to see what's been done and those gaps will start to present themselves and that curiosity that I've spoken about that will also start to feed it so you go oh but they looked at this but I wonder why they didn't look at that so selecting a topic isn't just kind of sometimes you'll be given one if you especially if you are in honors level um, but if you go further you probably will have to work and don't worry if your topic changes a little bit over time it might do that just because new research comes out or you find different things within your own research. So just be aware that you selecting a topic is a fluid thing that does continue, but you're going to be in that curiosity field that you have. Okay, very simple slide for such a long explanation, <laughs> but let's go into searching the literature. So this one is really made up of three steps. Finding things, managing things, and evaluating things. So the evaluating we're going to do in searching the literature as well as surveying literature. In this evaluating the literature, we're really focusing on, as you can see, the reading and depth and mapping your materials and so making sure that you've covered all your bases. Um, and we'll get to what the surveying literature does when we get there. But we'll start firstly with finding the literature. So. Very, very important, and I want to stress this, make friends with your librarian um, because we know where to find things. That's literally our job. Uh, sorry? I think it's somebody who just joined. I'll check that the microphone is muted. OK, <laughs> no, just making sure it's not a question. OK, so the, make friends with your librarians. They can really help you with what we call a search strategy, and I'll go into that very little bit but to be able to assist you with finding the literature and knowing which databases to use. And we'll get on to managing as well. So it's not just enough to find it. You have to kind of be able to keep track of things and there's different techniques you can use to do that. So for this purpose, I kind of used this example of the mental and physical effect of homelessness on women. That's my research topic. And what you need to be able to do to create a search strategy is to pull out your keywords. So you'll see I've pulled out a few keywords here. The minute that you have the word effect, you will go effect, impact. Those two kind of always go hand in hand. And then think about, you know, one person may use homelessness, one person may use homeless. Um, woman, it's woman, <laughs> um, mental or psychological. So you've got to think about alternative words as well. And this is where, like I said, making friends with your librarian, they know these tricks and they know which words to help you out with. You'll use these keywords to create what we call search strategies. So it's taking these keywords and then we use it in advanced searches or we use it with what we call operators. So you may have seen people writing things in quotation marks or something like that. And those speak directly to the database and kind of really help uh, make your search a lot more efficient. If you aren't sure, like I've said, third time now, but I'm, I'm just very passionate about this. Please come chat to your librarian. We've got advanced searches, but even though that happens, sometimes the databases aren't very user friendly, but we have to use them every day. So we know how to help you out there. So you'll take your search strategy and you'll start to look for articles. And as you get to articles, um, you will 
go per database and you will start to download them or start to keep them and you'll get into managing. If you're not sure which databases to use, keep in mind you've got library guides. So you can see here there's specific guides per subject and they will give you a list of databases that are relevant for your subject area. Um, when you think about what you're going to be collecting at this point, like I said, I, I just use articles interchangeably, but you're really going to think about what different materials uh, would cover. So you've got on the very left here, books, monographs and reference work. So you'll see there's a years, months, weeks and days. That's how long it takes to produce that item. So a book can take years to produce. So you can imagine the knowledge in a book will be a lot more in-depth and a lot more broad in certain ways than, for example, something that takes days to produce. So a book, if you think about, you know, political science and you think perhaps, OK, a book will talk about uh, the democratic state in America and how is it really what is liberal? What does liberal mean? And it'll go into all those definitions, whereas your newspaper may, might say Democrats are liberals because they want free health care. So those are the kind of differences you'll see in newspapers a lot more niche and a lot more specific to one thing because it takes so short to produce. In the middle there, we've got popular and trade magazines and we've got journals and periodicals. So we're talking about academic journals and periodicals here. Very important to note, academic journals undergo what is called a peer review process. If you are um, using Google Scholar, make sure to check back where your article comes from just to make sure that it's coming from a legitimate academic journal. And if it comes from a database that is on our library website or that you recognize, you can be happy and you don't have to worry. So that's why another reason why we'll always encourage you use the academic databases because you don't have to worry about kind of fake journals or things like that coming through, which does happen. Um, if you are looking for niche articles, so for example, if you are wanting, and I'm going to go back to my pine tree example, if I want to look at, you know, the Fainbos ecosystem, I will look for a book because that is a very deep and broad topic. Whereas if I want to look for invaders on a um, invaders impact on proteas, I'll look for a journal article because it is a lot more narrow in its topic. Journal articles only have, you know, <laughs> a few pages. It feels a lot longer when you read them, but they only have a few pages to get their point across. So whatever's discussed will be a lot more narrow and a lot more specific as opposed to a book which has a lot more space in it. So you make sure that you kind of have um, a mixture of these. When it comes to popular and trade magazines, that's really dependent on your discipline and it's the same with newspapers. For a literature review, you will never rely on these as a primary source. However, it is a good indicator if something is becoming a trend in, I want to say, uh, practice. That's a better word than the real world. Um, so for example, if you want to talk about big data and agriculture, Right now, there's really not that much written in academic journals because it takes months to a year to produce. And so the um, research just may not actually have been finished yet. Whereas, you know, in Farmers Weekly or Lampo Vietblad, they may have an article on it. So if you find absolutely nothing in your academic um, journals that speak to it, but you are finding that it is a trend in popular press or a trend in newspapers, it is possible for you to use it as an indication that it is a future research area. But that is really something you would chat with your supervisor about. Especially in certain disciplines, there are um, popular magazines that are well used, like The Economist, for example, but really stick to the left and right as much as possible, left and left, sorry, as much as possible, which are your journals, your academic journals and periodicals, and your academic books, monographs, and reference works. So you've done a lot of searching, you've made sure that you've got a variety of sources, we're getting to our managing. So when I talk about data, I'm talking about the literature items here. There's a table I'm going to show you that helps you kind of manage and it really helps if you start this table from the start because it's a lot of effort to have to do it at the end. If you're in the middle, you can still, if you feel enthusiastic, go about it. There are also reference managers, of course, that you can use. And I mean, the table will just give you an idea of what you are looking for. So you can do the same in a reference manager, for example. 
And really importantly, when you are busy doing your searching, you are not going to read right now. You're going to skim read to make sure that you actually are getting the things that are relevant. There is nothing worse than an abstract that promises the world and then you read the whole article and you feel like you've wasted your time. So skim reading is a very essential skill at this point in time. So this is the table that I spoke about. So we call this, a, it's, you can call it inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, literature review synthesis table is the name and you'll see I've highlighted in blue what oh, I see there's a typo there <laughs> I highlighted in blue what you can um, expect to be able to fill in at this point in time and we will get to what's in gray um, at a later point specifically in surveying the literature so that's why I spoke there at this point there is quite a bit of correlation between the two so you will automatically see the author year and title that's pretty much the citation so that's pretty easy to fill in you can just go and use any citation tool um, very important purpose of the study so you can usually pull that out of an abstract if not skim read until you find what they say the purpose of the study is um, it's important to note the method and to note sample so this is actually done in terms of questionnaires so this is actually it's quantitative, but if you are looking at qualitative research, this is just as applicable. Methodology should always be apparent. If methodology isn't apparent, then, you know, critique it a little bit and go, is this a good journal article? Um, practice, flex your critical thinking muscles there. Sample lets you kind of see... Um, Elizabeth? Yeah? Uh, here is a request just to go a bit slower. <laughs> no problem. Okay, do you guys want me to cover anything, to go back and cover anything? Uh, Ms. Sutherland, you can unmute your mic if you want to indicate. No, she says no. Okay, I will speak a little bit slower. Sorry, I tend to talk fast. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to restart this, um, mostly because my train of thought is now on speaking slowly. So the first one that you'll fill in is your author year and title. That, like I said, it's your citation. And what you are doing there is it's a quick way for you to be able to keep track of what the article is at a first glance. Your purpose of the study is quite important because you need to be able to tell what the study is looking at. So this topic, um, and you can see by the, the uh, words that are there, this topic is still looking at the homelessness, mental and psychological effect. So this study is relevant because it's testing a model to predict the likelihood of older women leaving homelessness based on factors. And it's looking at, you know, what actually is going on behind. How are people adjusting to homelessness? How are people getting out of it? In order to see um, you have to know what the method is, and this is very important. So if you are not sure what the method is, and this might be difficult to come across in literature studies, for example, or narrative methodology or something like that, um, it's good to, they should have a methodology section if it's an academic journal. So it's a good way to kind of question the article if you're not finding out what the method is. Um, but you need to know what the method is. The reason why is you might be wanting to have a look at a specific thing, but you know, for example, I'm going to do quantitative research or I'm going to do qualitative research or I'm going to do this experiment, but I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do in it. Literature studies will kind of show you the majority of people use this method and then you know, okay, I'm actually safe using in this case, quantitative questionnaires, because this seems to be in the research field, the methodology that's used overall. And in that way, it also, when you get to your methodology section, it gives you uh, literature, literary evidence for why you've chosen your methodology. So it's a really good thing to already speak about method at that point. Pulling out a sample is quite important. Um, you need to know how Look, sample is basically this one. They looked at 201 women. If the study only interviewed one woman, then you have to ask yourself, uh, the study really can't actually speak to one woman. That's an experience. That's not a research study. So then you 
you can already start to see I need to exclude this article because the sample method is not correct. And then really importantly, your findings. Um, so these findings are quite important because you can actually, when you read through your literature, yeah? Uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, there's uh, one or two questions coming through. Uh, the first question is, does scheme re scheme reading help us on this process of inclusion exclusion? Uh, do you want to give the question, second question too, please, Kofner? OK, uh, will the synthesis table help to map 100 plus resources? And, and then on this process, do we pull out everything on the article? Is the third question that came through now. OK, so the first one is, um, will it help to, will skim reading help? Yes, this is where your skim reading will, will be invaluable. You can fill it in if you read the article thoroughly through, but at this point in time, skim reading will be sufficient to be able to fill this table out. Um, 100 plus sources. Uh, yes, it will map 100 plus sources. Um, as this is why I said, as long as you use it from the start. You will also be able to rearrange the table if you've got that amount of sources um, and kind of start to group it by theme and so on. And then you'll see there is a themes column and there's a similarities column and so on. So yes, you can start to group by theme. Um, 100 plus sources is a lot, but dependent on what you're studying. So yeah. Um, on this process, do we pull out everything on the article? No, you only pull out what is written here. So the purpose, the method, the sample, and the findings. So you are summarizing those three, those three things, four things, sorry. Um, qualitative methods have samples. Yes, they do. So I'm going to give an example here. For example, I'm going to, so I'm going to use my own master study. Um, not to toot my own horn, but because it's the easiest example I can think of. I did qualitative interviews for my own master's study, and my sampling was five academics from three different institutions, and I did purpose of sampling. So I used the words purpose of sampling, um, which means I picked people. <laughs> it, not exactly, but it basically means like there weren't enough people for me to uh, do random sampling. And so in my thing, it basically says um, purpose of sampling and five academics were done. And this is how I managed to get the five academics. This is the method I followed. So I emailed them and then also. Um, for example, the other it was academics and it was library staff and for the library staff, I used purpose of sampling for all the people that worked in this specific division. And that is how I got to my sample. So there will always be a sampling section for qualitative studies as well. It's contained under the methodology section in an article. This um, table is not automatically generated. You use Excel, you have to populate it. You can use Excel or I will also speak to using a reference manager as well. Um, I've spoken about your findings are important because it's the main point. Um, yeah. OK, so I spoke reference management tools and there is a Mendeley session today and we do have Mendeley sessions ongoing. These are programs that store citations, manage citations, and then you can insert them while writing. So it's a bit automated. What you can do in Mendeley is you can create notes on your um, PDFs and it lets you see all the notes in one go. So you can put everything in one folder and in that way. It's a bit more laborsome and it doesn't give you this quick overview that the table does, but you can repeat the same thing. OK. Um, I see there's a question on marrying the synthesis table with Mendeley in Mendeley. Um, so yes, you'd basically use the notes fields. So you've got notes fields, which lets you over quickly overview everything in an article. And I know that um, in all our Mendeley training, we do cover that. So I would suggest if you're not aware of it, you're welcome to um, join any of our Mendeley trainings. Uh, there's another question that was asked a bit earlier. Um, 
Will qualitative methods have samples? If yes, can an example be given? Uh, yes, that was the example I gave of my own study with regards to the um, purpose of sampling for interviews, and that is qualitative studying. Studies. That was qualitative research design. Um, so I've already answered that one. OK, so skim reading. When you skim read, um, you'll start automatically by looking through the title, author, journal date. Um, you're looking to see, OK, is the journal and the title, do they match? Um, and then if it's relevant, you'll move on to obviously the abstract. So we do this when we search in general. Um, you read the abstract and then this is after the abstract is where things tend to go wrong, um, kind of go, yay, this is perfect. Now I'm going to download and read the whole thing. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> skip on to the table of contents. Often this might be on the left hand side if you're viewing in an HTML viewer. If there isn't a table of contents, um, then you can skip ahead. You can look at the introduction and you can look at the conclusion. So you, you miss the middle. And if at this point the introduction should tell you what the article is going to do, the conclusion will tell you what the article did and what they found. You can go a bit further and you can read the first sentence of every paragraph and the article will make sense. It sounds very odd, but the first sentence of each paragraph will tell you what that paragraph is talking about. If the introduction, which often happens, contains the literature review as well, you can kind of skip ahead and just read the conclusion. To do your synthesis table at this point, I would also encourage just reading the methodology section as well. And you can skim read that through reading that first sentence of each paragraph in the methods section. But your conclusion will give you what the findings are. So you'll use the skim reading really to a lot of effect. OK. And then evaluating the literature really comes to when you've got all your articles and now you start to actually read it from the start. And if you find that there are things that get raised in the articles that you haven't searched for, like gaps or omissions, you are going to redo your search and you're going to rescan through and skim through your literature. We're going to talk about mapping the literature as well. And you can map the literature in conjunction with doing this table. And um, I've seen it done quite nicely. So this is an example of mapping your literature. So it's taking your themes that you're pulling out and you're saying, OK, and you'll see this has actually got a lot to do with your keywords too. So our main theme here is homelessness of women. And we've got underneath this psychological effects. We've got community facilities. So you've got a whole bunch of articles speaking about community facilities. Then we've got physical effects. Okay. Just going to ask uh, for the mics to be muted, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got physical effects, and then after this point, um, you can also see what home is. So home in this case, my brain immediately thinks like home on a browser, but that's not what this is. This is about what home actually means in terms of income and in terms of support. So you can map your sub themes and what you can do at this point, if you've been doing your. Um, uh, let's go back there. Inclusion exclusion table. You can start to pull out some themes here already, and this is what I meant by some of these. Uh, steps may seem a little bit like they go together. You're doing them simultaneously. You can start to pull out a few themes here and you can actually write next to this. So say now this has to do with uh, community facilities, you can write next to it Sutherland 1987 article. And you can start in this way to map which articles actually fit under which topics. So you can do it either like this, like a little beautiful mind map if you feel creative, or if you are like me that is not very creative and Excel is okay for you, you can just stick to using your themes here. Okay, so everybody, I'm just checking, taking a pause moment. Is everybody still good? Um, a question just came through. 
Um, if there are two aspects of a research question, one effect on another, should one search for articles that only co uh, um, should one search for articles that can uh, that only cover both aspects of the research question, or can one search for articles that only cover one aspect, such as research on pine trees, separate from I think it was fainbos. <laughs> yes, so um, you would look for articles that cover either of your aspects, and I'm going for middle option there. So if you're looking for um, one and the other, one if one's effect on the other, you will start by looking at pine trees and fainbos specifically, but you will start to go a little bit broader and look at pine trees, indigenous environments, because you can then start to bring in international things. So it's a very, um, you will always start with your narrowest research question. And this is why I said really go speak to your subject librarian. So that pine trees example, I can tell you that the search for it is a lot broader than the example I used because you're looking at pine trees or pinus pinea, and you're looking at the effect on fainbos on um, uh, what's it, Cape Floral Kingdom, and more and more kind of it snowballs a little bit out because you're trying to make sure that you're covering all things. Don't separate it completely, which I think was what your second suggestion was. Always have a look, always make sure that there is kind of in relation to each other. But also keep in mind if you don't find anything into relation to each other, you will need to separate it a little bit more and look further. And that's why I really do suggest chat to your librarian because they'll be able to help you really pull out um, your keywords and also find those alternatives to it. Um, <laughs> okay, so I see the next the question about context and content. <laughs> okay, Kurt, I think you may have to clarify a little bit for me. Um, I think, yeah, you'll have to clarify it a little bit for me. You're welcome to use your microphone, uh, Ms. Horn. Uh, sorry, the my question was a bit vague. Um, uh, I think it's probably just because I don't I don't understand <laughs> some of it myself sometimes. Um, I've just heard supervisors tell me that you need to uh, break up your literature or not break it up, but um, have context and then content. So they just say like, the, I guess maybe the context of your topic um, and then going into more of the content of the literature itself. I'm, yeah, I, I've just heard um, pe people in the supervisors and social sciences will use those terms and I sometimes get a little bit confused as to whether they mean the context of the literature or the context of the topic, but perhaps this is um, a bit too specific, uh, you know, to, to a particular discipline. So it's okay, um, it's, I'll, you don't need to answer it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for thank you for trying. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm going to give it a shot, though. <laughs> I think I understand what they're meaning. So when you've got when you're talking about context, so um, context of a question, and especially in social sciences, because you are dealing with, and often you are actually dealing with um, qualitative research. So if you're not sure about Base, I'm going to very much simplify this, so don't quote me exactly on this, but quantitative research tends not to take the world around it into account, whereas qualitative research takes the world around it into account. So I'm said that's boiled down to the absolute basics. Don't quote me exactly on it. It's a lot more nuanced than that, and you're welcome to go look up the differences. But when you are talking about context, especially for qualitative research, you might be looking at a topic and it's got relevance and it seems like you're getting a lot of topics. But in terms of the South African context and in terms of the African context, you really have to have a look at the other um, things surrounding it. So a really good example right now is the COVID crisis. So in America, you know, they've gone, everybody must do online schooling and we've done much the same here in South Africa, except our situation is a lot different in the sense that we haven't got the same infrastructure 
um, and internet is a lot more expensive. Data is a lot more expensive here than it is, we know, pretty much anywhere else, as well as, um, you know, it's, yeah, we don't have that same context. So if you are busy doing a study on online teaching, you can have a whole bunch of stuff that speaks to the content of online teaching, a whole bunch of stuff that speaks to teaching in a crisis and so on. But if it never relates to the South African context or it never relates to your research context, so you have to look at what your research is, that situation that it's in, then it's not going to really be applicable. So in that way, yes, you're going to bring back your literature and make sure that it speaks to context. So you can speak to literature about online teaching and remote things and so on, but you will have to also then decide, and this is where the critical aspect comes in, discuss critically, does it apply in the South African context? Does it apply in your research context? So that's where that differentiation comes in. Um, I mean, okay. I, I don't know, does that help? I hope that helps. No, that, that, no that, that just helps clarify. I feel like I feel a little bit like it was such a redundant question and I'm, I apologize for taking up time, but thank you so much for answering. Thank you. No, 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 no apologies. Um, you have asked a question that others may also be struggling with, so never apologize for that. Okay, okay. see, someone else already said. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, just mute your microphone though. Okay. So let's go on to developing the argument. And this, <laughs> this is always the one that everybody looks at me very blankly kind of afterwards and now I can't even see your faces. So I'm gonna try my best here. Your literature review, as we talked about when we talked about the definition of it, it is a comp it's a kind of this critical evaluation and summary and it says what the current state of knowledge is on your research topic. The other thing that it does, which it does kind of really under the, in the background is, by the end of your literature review, it is an argument for your research. So it kind of leads up to, well, of course, this is what this person is studying. That makes sense, having read everything else there. So you've got to keep in mind that you are building this case and you're kind of providing these arguments for what your research is, and you're using the literature to do that. So um, when you build a case, <laughs> you're compiling and arranging everything to make kind of this logical thing so that when people read it, it makes absolute sense that it gets to your research topic. When we talk about proving a thesis you've made about the research topic, so this could be, um, I mean, it depends on your discipline. You might be working with a hypothesis. You might be working with a research question. You might be working with a research statement. All of them are actually the same thing, they're just phrased differently. But my point is just imagine that it actually leads to someone sitting there and reading the literature review and saying, yes, this research needs to be done. This person, 100%, I can see why it's important. I can, I can feel the need for this research after reading this literature review. And that's what that logical kind of structured flow will help with. And um, your set of facts is your literature obviously. Okay. So hold on to that because the next one gets, <laughs> um, I'm going to give an example. If you, oh, I should have changed this example, but <laughs> if you are wanting to know what to wear, um, you will automatically collect facts. So you're going to look outside, so you're relying on, you know, what, uh, what you see. You see there's clouds or there's no clouds. In today's case, I don't see clouds. Um, you're going to look online, weather forecast, watch the TV, listen to the news, whichever way you do it. And based on those two things, you'll decide what to wear. If it says it's going to rain, like yesterday it rained, you might take a coat, you might take an umbrella. If it says it's going to be hot, you might not take those two things. But based on those logical facts, you are making a decision. In the same way, that literature is going to be your logical facts, and that decision is going to be the need for your research to be done. I hope that that makes sense. It's it's always weird because you think of re literature kind of like you are summarizing, but keep in mind that you are actually, it's that critical aspect and it's, it's building to your research question. Elizabeth? Yes. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Uh, 
apologies for the surname pronunciation. Skonken, um, who's got her hand raised. OK, would you like to maybe ask a question? Hi, this is Crystal Skonken, uh, pretty much on point with the surname. Um, it's it's quite new. I'm a, I'm a newlywed still, so getting new, uh, used to the new surname. Um, anyway, uh, when you mentioned to one of the participants about uh, South African content, context, I always get a little bit iffy when I want to motivate my research question as being unique to South Africa, just because I don't always see um, I don't see it always in articles where I can quote this is unique to South Africa because of um, the internet and the infrastructure and people living in in dire conditions is it enough is it enough to say they i have newspaper evidence um i would uh, <laughs> it depends on what you are researching so i mean no newspaper evidence in itself is not enough you wouldn't quote and say things that you don't have literary evidence for. So what you would do instead is, I'm going to use the online teaching example. So for example, um, you know, the online teaching speaks to, okay, the best practice at this point, universities have moved online. And in order to allow for all students to be able to still attend their lectures, webinars should be held three, three weeks. And this is what was done at this university. And we let's pretend that's a research article. So you summarize this and you say um, most research articles and then you say you open brackets, put your citations, close brackets, um, agree that universities moving online was the best practice during COVID-19 times and the majority of them seem to rely on online webinars being present for it. However, there are a few articles that either disagree and you can explain why. And then further to that, you can say the authors of those articles did not take have not taken into account um, factors that are perhaps more applicable in South Africa. So if you are dealing with anything like online teaching or anything to do with that, I'd really encourage you. And this is where someone spoke about, you know, dividing your question, read up on um, infrastructure, read up on other aspects of things around your research topic. A big one for anything to do with that is what we call the digital divide. Yeah, there are a lot of articles on the digital divide and it may be not just applicable to South Africa but to other countries worldwide and then that will really get to, you know, you'll speak to, <laughs> this sounds really odd, but you'll say in countries where the digital divide is present, the approach that was taken by the majority of the articles is not necessarily applicable and then you will explain a little bit further about what the digital divide is and what the other articles the minority have then said so other options that have been given if all you have is newspaper evidence um, have a look at what the newspaper articles are using in terms of terminology and redo your searches for those phrases so look a little bit further and look around they will tend to one be a research article on it. Perfect. That was so helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so I'm on providing your arguments. So you've got two types of arguments here. So like I've said, your argument, let's just go back to what it is. It's the logical presentation of evidence and it gives you that conclusion, gives you that research question. And you've got two kinds here. So you've got this discovery and that is what's being done um, while you are busy you know, discussing and explaining the literature and doing that critical summary. But that advocacy argument is really where that critical thinking comes in. So what I said now, for example, is uh, I gave myself a good example. Well, you take the articles and you analyze it in terms of, you know, the knowledge that you've gained and does it actually fit into your research context? Does that agree with what you know or what you um, have found from the other articles? So remember that it's not, you're not trying to like throw people with facts here or throw people with things. You're trying to convince them and you're trying to get them to see your context and your research and the way that you view it. So 
um, you're giving that logical claim. You're saying this is what the literature said. This is I've explained what the literature said. I've explained what these authors have said. And I've given you reasons why these authors are applicable to my work. I've given you reasons why what these authors have said have meaning in terms of my context and why the, what these authors have said actually lead towards my research question, why they fit into my research question. And that gives you that conclusion. So this is when you are busy going back over and you evaluate whether or not your art, your stuff is actually doing. Remember, you've now written this. This will this will be like one paragraph as an example, your argument for one specific aspect. So you'll then read your thing over and you can say, OK, my claim in this, I'm just going to use the COVID-19 example. My claim in this is that universities move to online teaching, but um, a but the approach differed dependent on the context. And then I'm giving my evidence in terms of the different literature things and I'm saying this, this guy said this, that guy said that. And it's that you can see between the evidence and the claim, there's that link, it's the because. So it holds those two. So you say universities went online, but their approach differed um, due to a number of different reasons. The biggest reason was the context of the university, um, the country that just they situated in and the infrastructure in the country. So what the student population had and then you say this person says that most of the student population have access to Internet, have data. It's all uncapped. It's wonderful. They don't have any issues. This person said that is only true for this country and this is more applicable in my context. So you can see how those kind of all link when you are busy reading through a paragraph. Just make sure that you've got you can kind of see what you're claiming to be the fact and that you've got your literary evidence backing it up. Like I said, this is always the part where everyone looks at me and says like, I'm not sure what you've just said. So I'm going to um, give this example here. When you are writing an article, you'll say, I'm just going to put this here. You'll go to a street lamp. You see that the traffic light is red. So your brain says, don't cross the street. And that's the claim that you're making because that's the, the proposed truth. And the evidence that you're giving is you you've seen that the light is red and you say the light is red, don't cross the street. And that's really applicable if you've got children or you've ever dealt with young children. Um, you have to tell them why, because they're like, why should not I cross the street? Because the light is red. But Elizabeth. further than that, we don't really um, just let me finish quick. Um, further than that, it's because the light is red. The fact that the light means the red light means stop is that's what is the warrant. That's what the link is there between. OK, Kofner, you want to go? OK, it's just a Ms. Rock who would like to ask a question. Uh, if you want to ask with your microphone, you may. Um, thank you so much. Sorry, I, I just didn't want to take you back too far. Um, if you don't mind, maybe just going to the previous slide on the different um, arguments. Um, I just wanted to check with you in terms of, of crafting almost a thread to your argument throughout the literature review. Would it be good as you structure it in terms of your argument of discovery and your argument of advocacy to then link it to your eventual research question? And yes. almost as a way to say motivate, and that is why this study is looking at this. Because I've, I've just found that useful to, to split the literature in terms of which literature speaks to this particular aspect of my question. And it yes. helps to then conclude, okay. Oh, I'm so happy. Thanks. Yes, okay. that, that's exactly this whole section's point is that this you constantly linking back to your research question and and it's really giving that that like this is why my research is important. That's the entire point of this argument section, not just to confuse you. So <laughs> I'm very happy you asked that question. Um, so yes, link it back. Always link it back. Um, OK, so I've dealt that. So you can see here that you, your claim really is dealt by the fact that the right light is red. That was the point. OK, that was the, argue, the developing your argument. <laughs> um, Kofna, there's uh, any other questions? No other questions. I answered some in typing, but uh, Ms. Rock, could I just ask you to um, just lower your hand? 
somehow I'm not allowed to lower it. <laughs> Here's another question that just came through. When uh, we did the literature map, we formulated theme, if I may put it like that. How do we link it with evaluating the literature? OK, oh, let's go back. Right. OK, so um, the main thing with the, the evaluating the literature under um, under the searching part, and that's why I said it's not going to be the complete one, is you'll see it really is just um, doing those first kind of, I must say the right number, five sections. And then you can start to add themes in now. It is at this point really only checking whether or not you've dealt with all your themes underneath. So it actually links back into um, what the other question was about. If you don't have an article that speaks to something, then you would notice it at this point and then you would go do the search. So then you will find your your gaps and omissions that way and you'd go do searching again. When we get to the hardcore evaluation of literature, which is the next bit, um, then you will start to fill in that literature synthesis table a bit more. And you will then actually start to write simultaneously, and that's where that will come in. That mapping really is so you can see, I have articles speaking to this, I have articles speaking to that. So you can write little notes about the articles next to the map if you want to. Um, and say this one speaks to this topic, that one speaks to that topic. It really is not like a this is what you have to do. It's a tool to help you. So go as wild as you want. Um, I had a student, I think she took a looked like an A1. She folded it out. It was quite big. Maybe it was only an A3, but still. And she mind mapped her whole literature review and she wrote the articles and their main point um, under each subtopic. And she said she could just sit down and she met with a supervisor and she showed him everything and they could sit down and get started on the writing because she'd already done a lot of that thinking already. So that's where your theme mapping really comes in because it allows you to one. Uh, we spoke about developing the arguments, so your themes start to come in there, but it allows you to really start to look at how your writing is going to happen. And a lot of this, the point about doing it while you're searching and all of that stuff is that when you get to writing, you don't have to actually um, sit and redo this work. You just go from that. OK. Um, so with surveying the literature, you, we've already started assembling the data, and now we're going to complete our synthesis table, and we're going to kind of analyze the literature. So. The first thing is that we get a lot of um, evaluating literature aspects of things. So these are a few questions, and I did speak about a um, library guide that literally has these questions in for you. And we've got so many online learning tools, and this will be recorded, so if you're not sure, have a look. But you're going to look at a couple of things, like what was the purpose of the article? What are they trying to prove? If you get to the type of audience and journal, and it's not a scholarly journal, it's not a scholarly textbook and so on, ask yourself, is this really um, good to include in literature review. And as you heard when I said the newspaper is not really, you're going to rely almost exclusively on monographs, scholarly monographs and um, scholarly articles because you want that academic flavor. That's where you're coming from. You'll really only use anything else as a kind of last resort. And even then you might have to still link it back to something in the scholarly thing. Organization and content. A lot of this has got to do with whether or not it is a good article and this really is what the evaluating the literature is about this circle of evaluating i need to like say this evaluating the literature too or something but it's about checking whether or not this is a legitimate article a good article and one that you can really rely on if it's a terrible article you will really pick it up by now you will not know what the article is talking about you will not see that it's a scholarly journal it won't be organized it won't be focused it won't be understandable and you will throw this article out you know, chuck in the recycle bin, digitally throw it out. But if these questions are kind of getting tick marks and you are able to pull out those threads of why is this article, you know, there is the reader, are they actually writing for academics? Are they writing for, um, and but if you are at university level, automatically academics from first year, that's the level you're relying on. Well, are they writing for, you know, grade twos? 
you're going to rely on the ones for academics for your literature review. If it's organized and focused and presentable and understandable, you'll be able to quickly see. And then the last question, that original research, review of previous research or an informative piece, those three distinctions are quite important. Original research articles tend to be full on, this is the experiment we did, this is what we looked at, these are the interviews we did, and they write it up. A review of pre previous research, review article, a systematic review or something, is a literature review. <laughs> Those are really useful. Find them. They will give you a good grounding if you read it on your topic. And you can find a lot of articles that way. But it's a review of previous research. Remember that it's gone through somebody else's critical thinking lens. So if you find any articles in a review, you have to go back and find the original. An informative piece often is a, called a short communication, and that often is like a precursor to research that's being done. So it's like we're busy with this experiment, but we've already found something really exciting, so we're going to already write it up. So it's a really nice way to kind of say this is, you can still rely on it and you can say this is new research that's being done, this is a new methodology, this is a new thing, new development in the field. So those three differences are nuanced, but take note of them. Have a look whether or not the author has a bias. Right now in the, the world of the internet, you can type absolutely anything into Google and you will find fake academic articles that prove it. And I kid you not, um, I'm trying not to think of a touchy topic, but I keep thinking of touchy. Let's go with the world is flat. The world is flat has got scholarly articles behind it. And I kid, I'd like, look for it. it if you want a, an afternoon scrounging through the holes of the internet, you're welcome to. The point is that with the, in, with the advent of the internet, information became everywhere and it's very easy to fake um, academic articles. So you need to double check, does the author have a bias? If the author is coming from a university and looks legitimate, then you you know if it's from a Stellenbosch author or if it's a well-known university, you're okay. If it's from a, a research unit that when you Google the research unit, it doesn't seem to exist, start to ask yourself. Also the date. In general, the loose rule of thumb is the last five years. And I said loose rule of thumb for a reason. You don't want to rely on out of date research. If you're only relying on anything before the 2000s, I would worry. However, you get timeless pieces and I will use the word seminal articles. These are articles that set the research position. They really say in our field, this is what happens. And um, I mean, we've got an example for if you ever have to do anything with regards to theories in teaching and learning. Um, there's a thing called, uh, uh, there's a thing, a theorist called Vygotsky, and he was from the 30s. And to this day, you can still rely on his original works with up to date other works. So you'll say, one line about Vygotsky and you'll say what his position was, for example, and then you will back it up with more recent authors within your like loose five year period. If I say loose because if it's six years, it's still OK. Don't like only look at five years. So keep in mind your timeless work. So seminal guides it's like giants in the field really are useful. An author and uh, is the author an expert in the field? What else have they written? Really good way to find other articles. There are so many author profile websites now, like Google Scholar you can use, you can check ResearchGate. Um, some actually even have it on their LinkedIn. Um, I'm not saying go and stalk academics, I'm just saying go and have a look what else they've written. Because 10 to 1, if they've written one thing on your topic, they've written more, and you can find some more that maybe have other keywords that never would have come up in your search. Um, the author's employment is also important. If it's an academic researcher, you want them to be employed at an academic institution or at a research center. And has the author won any awards? You know, um, some things like Nobel Prizes for specific research do kind of lean towards it being a seminal author or being a giant in the field. So have a look at that. And then really important, and this is also where, what I got so excited about, is it relevant to your current research project? Does it speak to your topic? If it doesn't speak to your topic completely, ask yourself, do I put it in? So you can put it in a maybe pile and keep it if it's partially covering something. But if it doesn't speak to your research topic, don't waste time on that article. 
So when you're reading, these are really things that you need to kind of take into account to make sure that the literature that you're using is credible, legitimate, and you will already start to employ those kind of like critical thinking muscles about the article um, when you start with it. But really, the biggest issue is relevance um, in most literature reviews and ask yourself constantly, how does this speak to my research project? How does it speak to my topic? Okay. Um, what you'll also carry on doing at this point while you're doing that evaluation and reading, you can start to fill out your table, which is your inclusion and exclusion criteria. So this one was to do with the homeless women in housing. And you can see the theme that this spoke specifically about was housing under my topic. And then as I was reading this one, I started to notice that other articles spoke a little bit about the same thing. So I, for example, saw Butler's article, Washington's article, also said that mental illness contributed to homelessness. So I'm just making a quick note because that means that those three articles I can put together in one sentence and say, mental illness has been shown to contribute to homelessness. Citation, three academic articles. Um, and you can see that, you know, some other way. So it's just jotting these down. As you're reading, you can go back and add these notes in. Uniqueness, if you're going to have an article that says exactly the same as the previous article, then I would be worried. That tends to not happen. Every article has to have a unique aspect. So have a look at what your article's unique aspect and why it's important. If the uniqueness isn't important for your study, uh, then already you can see it's starting to go with do I include it or not. Data quality is really important. Um, and we do have some things that help on library guides. Um, I know I do. So in general, they are on the evaluation library guide. But make sure that you know you can see the method and that it's repeatable. That if it's, especially if it's interviews or something like that, that they speak about bias, because often that is an issue that comes in, especially for qualitative research. And then all results reported, no leaving out of results. We know that there are articles that get published where it comes out to 10, 15, I don't know how many years later that the academic, um, they call it fudge the data, they picked and chose data and things like that. So data quality is quite important. It just leads to the fact that you are relying on quality articles, quality academic articles. And if you are doing this, you'll quickly tell those fake academic articles out and you can just throw them out again digital recycle bin. Okay. Before we get to critiquing the literature, um, are there any questions at this point? Um, there's been some recommendations that should, we should leave uh, the remainder of the questions to the end of the session because I think we're over our time. Okay. Um, so hmm. you can finish and then yeah, there's I'm answering what I can, uh, but yeah, I think you can finish for now. Okay, so critiquing literature. So this sounds like you're going to go heavily into critiquing. Actually, this is critiquing your literature review. You're going to have a look at what is your current understanding and does this answer your research topic? If you can kind of already, and it's not going to answer your research topic, but like you know what, what they said, does it give that importance of why your research needs to be done? Does it link to that? If that is what happens, then well done, your literature review has made its pur purpose. If that isn't what happens, you'll have to go back and find those gaps and kind of do it. If there are gaps or omissions, you know, push your study, say this will fill the gap. So my own master's study, for example, I had two articles that were written in all of Africa on my topic, and they were only partially speaking to my topic as well. And I literally, wrote these two and then what I did was I advocated for how important my study was because it meant that in the African context and South African context had nothing had been investigated and my study will fill that gap and that's what you you will do you will constantly go yes my study will do this and that's the point of the literature review it shows that you know but it also does that underlying yes this literature uh, this research is needed okay writing the review <laughs> That's our last step <laughs> and the longest step. So when you are writing, um, it's an act of learning and owning the subject matter. So you're writing to understand what you are reading and to understand your own topic. But you also need other people to understand you. So you're writing to be understood. 
in this way, you'll write, you'll evaluate what you've written, and you'll edit it. So that drafting, that's 100% normal. Um, keep in mind that we've got um, other units at the university, like the writing lab, that will help you with this, uh, with the evaluating part, and will help you with those kind of things. Um, make a writing support group with other students that are in your um, department and critique each other's work. Have a look at that because it really helps um, you to be able to know that somebody else is understanding what you've written and it helps you to tighten up your review a lot. Write early and write often. So I spoke about how you will already start to write simultaneously to developing your argument and surveying your literature and kind of going. It's really with the selecting the topic and the searching with the first bit that you'll kind of do those alone. And then after that, you can start to write. The more that you write, it becomes a lot easier. Academic writing is never easy, um, but you have to sit and do it. So sit and do it. And then no one is going to look at your first draft, like when you sit down and you start to write. You need to just get it down on paper. So if all of it is bullet points, do it. If it's one liners, do it. Just get it onto paper because you can go back and fill in and reevaluate and rewrite that stuff. So just get it down on paper. Best advice I can give you. Not the easiest thing to do, <laughs> but the best advice. Main points when you're writing, you need that golden thread. So this is actually a research question. So again, if you've, con if you've got an argument, if you are following that synthesis table, if you're mapping things by theme, it will happen kind of automatically. Keep bringing it back to your research question. Keep bringing it back to your research uh, thesis, hypothesis, all of that. Um, you need to have really good signposts, so make sure you have nice headings, subheadings, and all of that that flow. So if you um, have a look just at your headings, does it make sense? Do, does actually everything fit? And does it all seem to flow towards your research question? And then often what's checked first is bibliography. So um, make sure that you have got good engagement with literature, that you've done your searching properly. And make friends with your librarian there. Um, don't block quote, paraphrase, break it up with commentary if you absolutely cannot think of anything else. Um, at most, you want to quote one line from an article, but if you do that too often, it's lazy. That's literally how it's seen. So rather paraphrase it, get that paraphrasing muscle up and going. Um, you could have the most wonderful, wonderful literature review and ideas, but I promise you if someone has to spend all the time correcting grammar, and I've had to do this, the content is lost because that sloppy and inaccurate presentation throws it off. Um, if somebody has to constantly fix referencing, it throws it off. So make sure that what you give to your supervisor, that your formatting is good, that your references are good. Um, these are just quick suggestions for your outline for literature review. And like I said, this is going to be recorded and these slides will be made available. So this specifically, I'm going to run through a little bit faster. So an outline says the focus of a literature review and it establishes why your subject's important. And it kind of already will stay if, if it's a well-researched field or if there's any issues within the field. Um, so you can, for example, say previously all the research done with regards to um, pine trees and fanbos focused only on one specific species, which was the alpine pine. And now we have know that there are other species. So, you know, you can see that you can already kind of flag why why your research is, is important in that way. Um, you will kind of include in this way a, a purpose around it. So your thesis statement in a way will kind of be reflected in what the literature review was done. So you'll say this literature review is done to be able to establish the importance around um, pine trees and rainbows. So it's that kind of thing. So it it will kind of blend in. This will maybe be a paragraph, really not that long. The main chunk of your literature review is your body, obviously. So you're going to divide this by headings and subheadings. Your body really is your summary and evaluation of things, and it's grouped often by major themes or your topics. Your job here is to really highlight those trends. And if there are things that there's agreement or disagreement about, put it in and say why, in terms of your study, you, which one you side with, not that you're siding really, but which one's more relevant for your, your context. 
if you are really stuck with writing, this paragraph structure helps. Write a topic sentence. It says, in this, uh, this paragraph will discuss, um, my words have left me, this paragraph will, will discuss uh, the effect of pruning on trees, especially, especially in winter months. And then you will elaborate, you'll say, pruning is a, um, Printing is a method in which tree branches are cut back, insert citation, and it is important for trees to be able to grow better, insert citation. Then you adding more evidence. So this paragraph structure can be used anywhere in your thesis. When we talk about data here, add in more literary evidence. So you can say, um, Van der Korf, 1927, says that pruning is essential for trees to be able to have good root structure. Um, and then you will link it to the next paragraph. Pruning is, uh, it is important to note Van der Kolf's topic, talk about root structure because it is particularly applicable for vineyards in South Africa. And then your next one will talk about vineyards and root structure. So you've made kind of that next, that link there. So use this, it's very like, it feels very labored, but if you're not, if you're struggling to write, it really does help. Maybe you're gonna go back and edit it in any case, so. I spoke about checking your headings and checking that it leads to things. So this topic was um, participatory leadership um, in 21st century organizations. And so you see, you're not going to start with what participatory leadership is. You're going to talk, start talking about leadership and leadership styles. And then you're going to start, start talking about, you know, 21st century organization as opposed to other organizations. So these are your main themes. So if you've already started to map your themes and do all of that, you'll see this is automatically kind of done. So you can just start to sit and write and bring in the literature. You can see, oh, I'm dealing with that theme, it's these articles. And it will lead down to what your topic is. And then the conclusion, it basically is a summary. So it says, this is everything I've discussed. This is why it's important. And really important here, this is why my research is needed. This is why my research is important. My research will fill these gaps. My research will save the world. Um, as it sounds sarcastic when I say that, but don't underplay your research. It really does have significance. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. Really put that passion and enthusiasm and that curiosity in there. Um, biggest issues, I have spoken a lot about these, but if you don't have things that relate to your research problem, it's going to be picked up very quickly. If you don't seem to define the most important and relevant ones, it's going to be picked up really quickly as well. So that's where that kind of mapping and stuff really helps. Secondary sources is a big no. You only do secondary sources if you absolutely, absolutely, absolutely cannot find the primary source whatsoever. And that 10 to 1 will happen once in a blue moon. Um, you are not going to relate to secondary sources because you're playing academic broken telephone. That's the easiest way I can explain it. You are already relying on what somebody else's thought on an article was. But they might be from a different context and they might be from a different view. And so you need to go back and actually see, did they interpret it and evaluate it correctly in, for your context? So make sure that you don't do that. In that same way, you're not just going to accept what another researcher says. Um, you're going to do that critical thinking exercise that we did. You know, where does it fit in checking the bias, checking those things? You're not going to pick and choose results. Um, and so in the same way, you're not going to um, leave out literature that disagrees. So if there is contention, remember, you can put it down and you can say why it's applicable or not applicable. Um, yeah. So a good literature review basically will demonstrate that you know what's going on in your topic and it establishes that you're a credible researcher. Um, it summarizes everything that's been done and says how your project's linked. Uh, so in that way, it creates this integration with your project and with this, what the subject is. And it also demonstrates that you are standing on the shoulders of other researchers and you've learned from them and that your research is now a starting point for new ideas some references always <laughs> and thank you <laughs> i'm going to stop sharing my screen there okay well Whew. um are they <laughs> um 
How do you, uh, how far back should I go with the questions? <laughs> Let's start uh, there. I answered most of them. Uh, <laughs> I did uh, copy and paste three questions that I did not answer. Uh, so to those of you, uh, we are going to continue recording. So if you want to review the answers to these questions later, you can just view the end of the recording. Um, but yeah, so the first question, could one say that the literature review is an extended rationale? Yes, you could for your research project. Yes, it's an it's an argument for your research project. So in that way, yes, it is an extended rationale. Um, look, you, you are really relying on what others have said, so you always have to bring it back to that academic work. Just keep that in mind. OK, the second question, uh, how do you justify in the uh, in the manuscript itself not including certain articles? For example, when a reviewer asks specifically for some references to be included, um, it is easy to do it in the rebuttal letter, but how do you do it in the manuscript itself? Oh, I see. <laughs> Hi, Astrid, I see it's you that asked it. Oh, OK. Um, how do you justify not including certain articles? So if you are wondering why I'm thinking so much about it, there's actually a lot of Astrid is highlighting a, a, an issue that has come up in academic circles where reviewers are able to ask you to include their own articles and say that it's needed and so on. So that's the context that I'm looking at your question through. It is a difficult one. Um, you can easily say I didn't include it because it's not relevant. But in the manuscript itself, um, you can always start off sentences with saying that what follows is a selection of articles that are relevant to the context, to the current context of the research project. It is not an exhaustive list. It is not those kind of academic ways of saying I haven't included absolutely everything here. Um, and the reason why you would say that it's not an exhaustive list is basically you telling the reader they need to go carry on searching. Um, in general, if you can justify it in a rebuttal, you can justify excluding it, but it is difficult. Um, in the manuscript itself, you would use words like it is not an exhaustive list. Uh, this what when when you discuss in the introduction what you're actually doing in your literature review, you will at that point say the literature summarized is, uh, are applicable to the current research context and then you will repeat your research context. So for your purposes, Astrid, you will say phonology, uh, phonology, enology, sorry, um, and specifically perhaps volatile acidities in the in the context of South African red wines, South African white wines, which is one your projects on. And and so that way you already start to say, OK, well, I'm excluding anything that's not really relevant to the South African context. It's difficult. I agree with you, but you have to kind of be careful with the academic language there. That's pretty much the only way. Um, uh, I see there's one about background. Yeah, so this is really um, dependent on faculty guidelines. I'm skim reading through the questions here, so if you don't know, I'm reading so quickly. So a lot of background, yes, is in fact in chapter one. 100% um, true. And uh, for humanities. However, for sciences, chapter one is the literature review. So remember that it look at your faculty guidelines and it's basically your if you're on the sciences, your background will be your literature review. You you may provide a short like background to the actual um research the actual experiments and stuff happening, but in general, yeah, that would be it. Um, when we talk about background in terms of my introduction it's it's and like I said, those are guidelines. They're not that really does dependent. So you're not going to include an introduction to literature is going to be like a paragraph. You're basically saying why you're doing it and why it's important. Um, and you know, in specifically bringing it back to your thesis thing. So it's done sufficiently in chapter one. You don't have to really include very much, but it depends on your faculty. Um, OK, one to watch the recording. OK, sorry that we went for over the time. OK, thank you, thank you. Thank you that it was valuable. That's very important for me. Um, define more strictly and clear the aim. Yes, that's it. OK. 
Okay. Yes. So if um, there aren't any questions, then I think we can close this. Um, there will be recordings sent out to everybody. Yes, I think, uh, yeah, that concludes it. So I'm going to end the recording now.